Okay, um, so um, it's really an honor, a pleasure for me to introduce uh, Dr. Patricia LaRusso, uh, who's um, rather new to Yale. It's been uh, three months. It seems like much longer given all the projects she's accomplished since she's here. I think many of us know her, but for those who don't, uh, Pat has a number of uh, roles, but she's the Associate Director for Innovative Medicine. And what you'll see today is certainly innovative. We were actually very fortunate. We were working with her as part of this UM1 uh, when she was at Carmino's Cancer Center as one of the sites, uh, working very closely with Paul Ader and, and Juliana and others. And then she came here, so we have the whole thing um, with, with some collaborators. And really, today, you're going to hear about the UM1, about phase one studies, translational phase one studies, and the way that we can all work together with Pat and, and, and her, her program. So Pat, thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, so when I was thinking of what to talk about, I thought, well, what better thing to talk about than the UM1 funding mechanism? And the reason why I thought about doing that instead of talking about one of my specific projects is because I think that the UM1 funding mechanism offers us, in, as a cancer center, the opportunity to bring a lot more translational uh, projects to the table. And so I just thought that I'd just update you on what the UM1 funding mechanism is relative to what the UL1 funding mechanism is and how we can all take advantage of it as a cohesive team to bring projects forward and hopefully bring additional funding mechanisms as well. So, um, just to, so basically, um, the UM1 is a new funding process. It, uh, the funding began uh, for most centers in March of 2014. But because I was in the process of figuring out where I was going to live for the next five years, I was very lucky in that the NCI allowed me to put an institutional grant um, on hold. So I requested a notice of award hold. And then when I eventually figured out where I was going to go, um, I worked with the dean at my university to be able to transfer this. So it's one of the few institutional grants that's ever been transferred outside of an institution. And basically, it's a cooperative agreement in a granting mechanism, unlike the current NO1s, which are contract mechanisms for phase two trials, but that is also going to be changing. And hopefully, we're going to be going after one of those here in the next several months as well. But this allows us to perform early phase clinical trials with investigational agents that are held in the CTEP portfolio, which offers the advantage in that the NCI would hold the IND of those specific agents. But the reason why the UM1 was formed, and they brought a task force together to ask us what we felt needed to be changed within the NCI portfolio, um, because there was a lot of stuff being done, but there really wasn't any collaboration, and there really wasn't a lot of translational science going forth. I held the UO1 for 19 years before they recompeted the UM1. So I got it a few years after I became an attending physician at Carmanos. But we felt that it needed to, and they agreed, it needed to encourage team science because that's the way of the future, translational science for obvious reasons, collaborative groups with synergy, sites with funded research. And so they were focusing, they wanted to focus on sites that had spores, program project grants, collaborative R01s, and sites with significant early phase clinical trial experience. And equally, if not more importantly, they put a huge emphasis on mentorship. And we'll be talking a little bit about the Cradle Awards, but the Cradle Awards are essentially letters of intent or proposals for clinical trials that are submitted from junior faculty that have not been peer reviewed funded and have been within the first seven years of their academic career. And we'll be looking at one of those that was just recently awarded to us in the next several minutes. So basically, this is just an overview of where they are. Um, as you can see, the PO1s are in yellow, the um, spores are in white, and the previous UO1 sites were in red, and originally there were 14 of us. We were supposed to get 12 funded, but what they did with the um, final funding mechanism is um, they had to do a little bit of tweaking. So they funded 12 of us, but only five of us were fully funded and the additional seven were only partially funded. But what they tried to do with the UM1 mechanism, as you can see here, was try to bring a universal pro, uh, group or collaboration throughout the United States and including select sites in Canada, spearheaded by the partially funded UM1 out of Princess Margaret with Lily and Sue. So the difference between the UM1 mechanism and the UM1 mechanism is that, first and foremost, molecular characterization is now expected. 
because most of the drugs that are coming through are either immunotherapeutic and uh, targeted with an emphasis on signal transduction. You obviously need molecular characteriz uh, characterization if you're not just going to guess at what you're doing or just do haphazard clinical trials, especially early phase trials that we used to do in the uh, olden days about three years ago and be beyond. Um, they, team science was obviously required because in order to do translational work, you definitely need scientists thinking like physicians and physicians thinking like scientists. And then we felt that the other scientific element that was crucial is that we had to answer critical unanswered questions, either disease-based, biomarker-based, or drug combinations. And that was another expected um, outcome from the UM1, which was extremely, which was rather rare with the UO1 mechanisms. Additionally, these were much more integrated, and the NCI allowed them, developed a more comprehensive um, a more comprehensive support system in, uh, in terms of safety, auditing, data managing, uh, data capturing, and monitoring. And also, all of the trials are required to go through a central um, IRB, which is distinct from the NCCN, NCT, NT, NCTCN or whatever, as well as the N01 mechanism. The UM1 has their own central IRB, um, as well as, as you can see, some of the other pivotal points. And they also mandated improvement in timelines. So from the approval of the LOI, and hopefully tomorrow on our telecon, we will be getting our final approval of the LOI that was just submitted by one of our other investigators. Um, the opening of the trial to, fir uh, well, the first patient on is expected to be within 15 months. And um, set aside for molecular characterization and sample acquisition, because they have fewer sites than they did with the UO1s and various other parameters, they set up molecular characterization hubs, um, initially in the first year being rather exploratory, and then hopefully we'll be taking the molecular characterization hubs forward in the subsequent four years, which will be the pivotal two sites that will do the molecular characterization for all of the other sites throughout North America. So when I was at Carmanos, I submitted this, and this is essentially what my grant looked like. Um, I knew that we needed integration in terms and certain pivotal components of integration, one of them being spores and PO1s. So I asked Vanderbilt to join us. They were in the top five of matrix cancer centers for peer review funding at the time in the United States. Obviously, I knew um, Paul, and I had been here previously, but also I knew that we were one of the top five computational programs in the United States. Um, and as a result, I knew that computational science was going to be extremely important, at least in the subsequent three to five years of the funding mechanism, if not within the first few years. And all three of the sites, especially Vanderbilt and Yale, had ex amazing imaging capabilities, which was another strength that we brought to the table. And at the time, because I was involved in an innovator or a DOD team science award, Stand Up to Cancer, and a Komen Promise Grant with Jeff Trent, who was the president and CEO of TGen, not knowing exactly how long it was going to take to integrate the um, genomic capabilities of Yale into this program, I kept TGen on board for um, combinatorial genomics as well as bioinformatics, and I knew that their turnaround time was 10 to 12 days with whole genome exome and RNA-seq, and I knew that we would need rapid turnaround in order to be able to get the data that we needed to be able to treat our patients. Biostatistics, Yu Shear is probably one of the best biostatisticians in the world for clinical translational early therapeutics, and so he spearheaded our biostatistics and still does out of Yale, and then obviously proteomics was strong there as well. So the challenges, obviously, we're going after studies that are going to have smaller patient populations because we're molecularly defining diseases, and we needed scalable, flexible program that could rapidly adapt to accrual needs. And therein lies why the Early Therapeutics Clinical Trials Network was formed. We knew that biomarkers were going to be pivotal, biopsies were going to be required, and in all prior funding mechanisms, biopsies were not included in the denominator of the budget. And so as a result, this, project, this funding mechanism included funding for serial biopsies on every patient that is recruited to trial to a max of two biopsies per patient with some additional support that you can apply for through another funding mechanism for functional imaging if your protocols include functional imaging. So what you can do with the UM1 oftentimes is add supplemental grants 
But the reason I've had probably 40 funded peer-reviewed grants over the last 20-some years is because whenever I had to do translational work, I had to apply for an R01 or an R21 or whatever. So it all fed off of the core grant, which was the U01 then, which is the UM1 now. But it allowed for more facile mechanisms for translation. And this is essentially what they did. And Katie Poliglia is one of the team science leaders for um, the EGFR team science project that's going forward. And what they do is they team up. Instead of having all these solicited LOIs with 90 to 115 LOIs coming in, of which they're only going to grant eight, what they decided to do was make it much more user-friendly and create teams of scientists with clinicians, with translational scientists, cancer biologists, and also allowing the centralized support for expedited uh, approval. Unfortunately, Katie's team was developed during my transition, and we lost out on being the lead clinical component to the project that she's one of the lead scientists on, but that only makes us more alert for subsequent projects that are coming down the pipeline. So in terms of biomarkers, obviously most of you know this, but you know, the, the challenge lies primi primarily in integral biomarkers, but for many of our projects, in order to be able to pre-select patients, you do need integral biomarkers. And therein lies one of the other reasons why the molecular characterization hubs were created, so that they could assure CLIA certification in patient pre-selection. Um, obviously, most of our studies have a lot of integrated biomarkers, but for early phase trials, most of your biomarkers are going to be exploratory or a combination of all of the above. I tend to stay away from surrogate biomarkers because I really want to know what's happening at the tumor level rather than in the PBMCs or whatever, but every so often on rare occasion they do find a place within one of our clinical trials. But because biomarkers are such an important component and because these trials can be challenging in terms of patient numbers, obviously one of the focuses and why the senior investigators are paired with the junior investigators is to hopefully teach alternative trial designs, which obviously are taken into consideration with each project that goes forward in terms of development. In terms of the molecular biomarker character, uh, characterization hub, it was one of the first supplements that I applied for actually for Yale while I was still at Carmanos and we successfully competed this biomarker hub. Um, there were two that were awarded for the Early Therapeutics Network. Um, Dr. Sklar is the genomics component at Yale, and the other site that was successfully awarded was Harvard. So um, there were about 15 of us that competed it, and two of us um, were awarded this for all of the early therapeutics trials that are going to require integrated or integral um, um, Pro, uh, genomics, and obviously they're considered the centers of excellence, and they are being developed as the uh, certain other um, biomarkers, other than molecular biomarkers, are being developed as the need arises relative to the drugs. Most all the drugs now for the CTEP mechanism have to go through the next um, study section, which I co-chair, and basically what our study section does is decide which drugs are going to be taken into the CTEP portfolio, which gives those of us that sit on the committee somewhat of an edge of knowing what's coming forward so that uh, we, can, uh, we can be prepared if we have scientific expertise to join those project teams and or clinical expertise. So there are two types of LOIs that can get funded, um, and all of the LOIs that I pretty much submit are translationally uh, focused. Um, you can have the NCI team science initiated LOIs that are pretty much invited to the table, or you can have the non-solicited LOIs uh, that will go into clinical trials, which is what I've typically focused on based on working with scientists who have, I think, great ideas that need to be translated into the clinic. And we'll show you a couple examples of the latter um, as we go along from here. So here I just want to show you a few of the examples of a couple of the trials that we've done and are working on um, as we move forward to give you a feel for what you can potentially t use this grant for or take advantage of this grant for. It's not only open to the phase one team, but early phase two trials can al also go forward as long as the compounds are in the CTEP um, pharmacopoeia they can be used, uh, you can use this mechanism for funding. Additionally, if there are drugs that are not in the pharmacopoeia, 
but you want to use them in combination. So currently, we're negotiating a combination of a check kinase inhibitor with a PARP inhibitor. The check kinase inhibitor is a small molecule from the Genentech portfolio. Genentech routinely does not work closely with CTEP. And the biomarin compound is one of the most potent PARP inhibitors currently available. Um, we've done a lot of preclinical work that I've done over the last few years with check PARP combinations when I was at Carmanos and working in the lab. And we've recently been able to accept, access both of those drugs. And we're working with Genentech currently to get a one-time CRADA exception to be able to add that drug to one of the CTEP drugs so that we can explore the combination clinically. So one of the areas, obviously, that's been near and dear to my heart is PARP inhibition. Um, when I was at Carmanos, just before the last funding of the UO1, five, seven years ago now, um, I recruited a young woman from University of Maryland, um, Angela, Angelique Berger, whose one of her interests was DNA damage repair. Um, her second PhD was, uh, had focused on this. And so I recruited her to work with me, and um, we worked together quite collaboratively. We were very successful in just the few years she was there. She ended up, unfortunately, being one of my patients before she died at the age of 42. But um, nonetheless, she had done some pretty great things. And um, one of the projects we worked on was Viliparib, or AVT888. I was always interested in CPT11 and breast cancer. I had spearheaded the oral phase two CPT11 study that unfortunately never made it to clinic despite having a 45% response rate because of uh, some problems with uh, um, the drug coming off patent and the company did not want to invest in a randomized phase three trial, which would have been required for FDA approval. So I used to really like CPT11, especially in triple negative patients. And so one of the thoughts was, why don't we look at CPT11 in combination with the PARP inhibitor ABT888. For those of you that are not familiar, CPT11 obviously works by one of its mechanisms. Primary mechanism is uh, DNA damage, as you can see here. And normally, that would be repaired with the, with the PARP enzyme. And what the PARP inhibitors do is obviously inhibit base excision repair so that the repair cannot go forward and so that the patient, uh, the, not the patient, but the, but the tumor cells will remain hopefully dead. One of the ways that you can monitor, in addition to response, the, act the actual effects of these drugs is by looking at the downstream targets and upregulation of such things as gamma H2AX or effects on ERCC1 can also be measured in the tumor to help determine whether or not you are getting some type of an effect with these biomarkers. So what we did is we looked at this and many, many different in vitro and in vivo model systems but just to go through briefly, one of the model systems we looked at was obviously breast cancer model systems as well as ovarian, based on the ERCC1 um, expression in these cell lines as well as the BRCA expression in these cell lines. And we did notice that in combination relative to monotherapy, there was of uh, CPT11, I know there's no ABT888 in this, but there are some, but they weren't the BRCA mutant lines, so I didn't show those. But what you can see is that the combination had significantly greater cytotoxicity relative to the monotherapy in the BRCA, uh, BRCA mutants, but also ERCC high uh, cell lines uh, relative to the wild type, as you can see here, and the ERCC high ovarian lines relative to the ERCC1 lows. So um, looking more specifically as we looked at these lines and looked at the downstream biomarkers, as you can see here, with monotherapy ABT888, not much of an effect on gamma H2AX for 24 hours post-treatment, CPT11. But when you gave the two drugs in combination, you got um, marked alteration of gamma H2AX, again, suggesting that um, not only are you seeing the cytotoxicity, but this could potentially be used as a biomarker of effect. We took it into the clinic, we took it into the mouse in vivo and looking at the MX1, again, the BRCA mutant model, as well as the ADDP model, what you see is some activity with monotherapy, but in combination, significant in vivo efficacy. And so we felt we had enough preclinical data based on the in vitro and in vivo data, much more that you don't see here, unfortunately, that we, we went after an LOI to look at this drug combination, first and foremost, as a phase one clinical trial in patients with advanced solid tumors, because the drugs had never been given before in combination. And this is essentially what our trial looked like. We 
didn't think at that time that we could do three serial biopsies on patients. And so we had to maximize our biopsies. We know better now we can do three serial biopsies. But what we wanted to know was if CPT-11 did upregulate PARP, could we see that upregulate? Well, you couldn't do a comparative because you didn't have a baseline at the time. But if you did have that upregulation with CPT-11, um, could you then, after giving the ABT-888 compound, see alteration of PAR, PARP, well, we looked at PAR instead because it's an easier assay, but it's pretty correlative, to determine whether or not at least biochemically or molecularly you were seeing some alteration of effect with the drug combination. Um, we, because it was a phase one trial, we had to obviously do what all phase one trials do and identify what the recommended phase two dose is. I only show you this because the recommended phase two dose was 40 milligrams BID of Viliparib with CPT-11 at 100 milligrams per meter squared weekly. And this is significantly lower than most of the other drug combinations of about 300 to 400 milligrams BID with many of the other cytotoxic drugs that uh, ABT-888 was, um, was given in combination with. And this is one of the things that's been, that has led us to the amendment that we're submitting this week, and we'll talk about that in the next several minutes. But as you can see, in the majority of patients were not colon cancer, Howard. There were only four of them that were colon cancer because I know CPT-11 was the cytotoxic agent. But this is pretty unparalleled for most phase one clinical trials. And many of these patients actually were triple negative breast cancer, which is one of the areas that I've been interested in for years. And this is just looking at many of them had BRCA mutations. The four colorectals, only two of them had responded. Um, and so, and did we see alterations in PAR? The blue lines are pre-ABT pre, um, 888, post-CPT 11. The magenta lines are post-ABT 88 after CPT 11. And what you saw across the board, for the most part, in all patients where we were able to successfully get paired biopsies, that yes, indeed, we were affecting PAR, and we did get significant alteration of PAR levels when we gave the ABT888 relative to just monotherapy CPT11. So biologically, we were doing what we were supposed to do in the patient's tumor. We also confirmed this in PBMCs, but I didn't think that was real relative. And the other thing we did see, and I didn't have the slide here, is we did see upregulation of ERCC1 as well. And unfortunately, because it was such limited precious tumor, we did look at gamma H2AX. And in the samples that we did have pre and post that we had enough tissue for, we also did see upregulation of gamma H2AX, but primarily in the patients that were responders. And we're going to be looking at that as we go along in the uh, subsequent amendments as well. We uh, unfortunately, Angelica had died in the middle of this, so we uh, enlisted the Translational Research Lab at the NCI to finish all of our biomarker studies for us. Um, so then what happened is we decided triple negative breast. You know, I see a lot of horrible triple negative breast. About 50% of all the patients I recruited at Carmanos were African American. We had a lot of triple negative breast, horrible lesions. And so seeing that we saw suggestions of response, what we really wanted to do was look at triple negative breast. And because there were some patients that were BRCA mutant, but we didn't have BRCA mutation on the majority of patients because we were routinely not looking at BRCA at the time, what we decided to do was look at an expansion cohort where we only treated triple negative breast cancers, but we had a cohort of BRCA mutant patients and a cohort of BRCA wild type patients. We recruited to this trial with Jeff Shapiro at the Dana-Farber who used to work pretty closely with Paul when he was there. And Jeff and I have done a lot of trials together. He wanted ER positive patients as well, and he actually got one through. But the problem is, is we didn't have any money to fund the expansion cohort. We could fund the trial, but we couldn't fund all of the science. So I uh, convinced Max Swisher that we needed to write a Komen Promise grant together so that we could look at triple negative breast cancer. And I don't know how we did it, but we got it. We got our Pro Komen Promise grant. And uh, we had to put a stem cell twist on it, but that's okay. Um, not that it helped us too much, but I got, I got my objective fulfilled. I was able to do the trial. And um, in the meantime, we also were able to go over to Ghana every about three times a year and work with Lisa Newman. And uh, what we did is we set up uh, mastectomy clinics, and the women would just line up and just hordes. And we would actually do physical exams on them 
while they were waiting in line outside of the clinic. Um, horrible breast cancers. And um, the uh, incidence of BRCA mutation in those women is roughly 85%. And the majority of all of their tumors was triple negative. So the focus that led us to get the Coleman Promise Grant, and I knew that we had access to those patients, was is there racial differences in triple negative breast cancer that can help us with the African Americans in the United States? Because most of my patients were African American. Most of Max's were Caucasian. And then obviously Ghana was 100% black African. And so what we did is we pulled those tumors so that we could look at genomic and proteomic differences of their tumors to see whether or not there was a differential that could lead us to subsequent therapeutic interventions and comparative analysis with our patient population. So because we were doing all of that, and we were looking at stem cell effects, and also to determine whether or not I thought there might have been a genomic difference between stem cells versus bulk tumor cell, we had to pull a lot of tissue. And here's where we figured out that, yes, we could successfully do three serial biopsies with five cores each to be able to assess whether or not we could fulfill all of our biomarker endpoints, and they were huge. And at the same time, the NCI wanted us to pull circulating tumor cells for them so that they could look at gamma H2X and ERCC1 and CTCs because they were trying to develop the assay. So this is essentially what it was in BRCA mutant and wild type patients. There were 10 patients in each cohort. It was a little bit expensive, so we didn't have more than that. But we were only going after proof of concept to determine whether or not we needed to move forward into a randomized phase two trial with this combination. What was interesting is I always thought CPT11 was a great drug, but when you gave it to BRCA mutant patients, no surprise, there were no responses. However, when I gave the combination, BRCA wild type, excuse me. When I gave the combination to the BRCA mutant patients, as you can see here, the one here is the ER positive patient of Jeff's. But there were seven of 10 responders. We got 70% response rate. And actually, two patients are on. I pulled up the data in the middle of the night. They've been on over two years now. So yes, indeed, this is an effective combination in this patient population. We were doing genomics. That We did a lot of genomics on the mammospheres. We grew mammospheres so that we could do genomics because we didn't have enough with single cells. But we were able to do genomics on a small, small number of cells. And what we did find was we found a pattern of genomic expression that was different in the responders versus the non-responders, but small patient numbers that we were able to do this on. And what was also very interesting is um, because this was a stem cell targeted grant, we had to look at a lot of the stem cell focused genomics. And as you can see, BMP4 and TSC here were quite unique and the, the expression levels were much different or the mutation levels were much different in the responders versus the non-responders. So we are gonna take this forward with more extensive genomic sequencing for confirmation of this signature and one other DNA damage repair signature that we had some preliminary data on in the subsequent study. So one of the proposed mechanisms of how PARP inhibitors work is by trapping. And I know Yves Pamier at the NCI has done a lot with trapping, and his, his, one of his claim to fame is that he can do this. But there were a lot of people, including myself, that were somewhat skeptical of the assay technique. That and we had just lost out on this phenomenal LOI that Paul Ader had submitted, and it really angered me. And Ohio State he had this, this assay that they were doing for PARP inhibition, and I'm like, or, or trapping. And I'm like, oh my God. And you know, one day Jeff Shapiro and I are sitting there, and how could they have beat us on this LOI? Nobody beats us on our LOIs. I think we had too much science and we just blew them away. So in the next couple of weeks, we're going to dumb it down a little bit and resubmit it, and I think we'll get it. We just got to make it understandable for the readers. That's one thing I'm learning as I go along. And maybe I should have wrote it because you know, I don't know the science, so it had to have been, you know, anyway. So anyway, but in the meantime, we had to set up an assay to look at trapping. And who else but Joanne Sweezy? I knew I came here for a reason. So anyway, I sat down with Joanne and I said, Joanne, we want to look at, you know, PARP trapping as, uh, trapping as a mechanism of effect. And oh, by the way, we want to redose the ABT888 because other studies are getting three to 400 milligrams BID and we were only able to get 40. Something is going wrong. My toxicities didn't make sense. I think I just had a couple bad patients, but nonetheless, we moved forward and we got response. But wouldn't it be great if we could get better than a 70% response? 
So the NCI said, okay, why don't you submit a proposal? And we've sat down with Joanne. We've submitted a proposal for dose escalation looking at intermittent dosing to see whether or not we can maximize the potential trapping effects. And Joanne is going to help develop uh, an assay to look at trapping, and we just got funded to do this work. Um, thank God we got funded to do this work. So we're going to be going forward with this amendment. Um, I promised the NCI it would be in their hands by Friday. So um, we, we're just working on rewriting the protocol, but it'll get there. Trust, it has to get there. I have no other option. So anyway, one of the last studies I wanted to talk to you about, which I'm pretty excited about uh, being able to have the UM1 here to be able to bring these studies forward, is what I think is a phenomenally brilliant study that Julianne Jurgensmeyer has put together on the phase one team. And remember, cradle, grants are, cradle LOIs are important. And it's easier to get an LOI approved if you have a junior investigator, believe it or not. So Julianne worked very closely with Joseph Kim and many of the translational science team who are all involved in this, um, in this proposal, which I think is pretty exciting. What happened at ASCO 2014 was, I think, a phenomenal event. Uh, it had to do with a, a drug called Olaparib and then a drug called Sidirinib in ovarian cancer patients. And I think the data that came out of this randomized phase two trial essentially re resurrected a near final, uh, an almost death of a drug called Sidirinib. And what the investigators that spearheaded this study out of Harvard showed was that if you gave this drug combination to ovarian cancer patients, you were able to get a significant increase in progression-free survival. But I think one of the most fascinating things that came out of this study, which led to the proposal that Juliana and Joseph have put forward, was, yeah, you did see an improvement in PFS in BRCA mutant patients, but with a PARP inhibitor in combination with a VEGF inhibitor, even in BRCA wild type patients, and actually more pronounced in BRCA wild type patients, you saw this phenomenal improvement in PFS. And so the question was, how could this be? And interesting, when this data was presented, we were rushing to get this LOI in because we thought everybody and their cousin was going to go after this combination now. But fortunately for us, we were the only ones who thought about it. Thank you, Julianne. So basically, I think a lot of the thinking that she uh, was able to put forth was because of her experience with both of these drugs when she was at AstraZeneca. But I think equally, if not more importantly, and I think she would agree, is because of the phenomenal DNA damage repair team that we have here at Yale. Thank you, Yale. And thank you, Dr. Glazier and Dr. Sweezy again. So what the team here at Yale has demonstrated that tumors in a hypoxia state, hypoxia state, lose, um, or re uh, hypoxia leads to the reduction of DNA damage repair genes and pathways, as you can see here with BRCA1 and uh, RAD51, which ultimately leads to this BRCA state, which again, similar to the, uh, the, the pathway chart that I showed you previously, leads to DNA decreased homology and recombinant repair, which would subsequently lead to increased PARP dependency. So a very busy slide, but as you can see, there's tons of translational science in this. And it took the NCI team over two hours to debate whether or not this was going to go forward, but it was dumbed down compared to Paul Ader's, just a little bit, thank God, so that they realized the importance of looking at all of this, especially in those BRCA wild type patients. So we're going after non-small cell, triple negative, pancreatic, in small cell, looking at this concept in this trial with, again, extensive serial biopsies and also bringing our functional imaging team together with Richard Carson et al. to be able to determine whether or not we can truly define what that mechanism is, especially in these subtypes of diseases. One of the last slides is that this, these aren't the only two trials. In fact, we have several other trials coming forth. As you saw, we're working with Vanderbilt and Dr. Wail El Rafai has been working with Alice Sirtib and um, Folfox in combination preclinically, especially in upper GI malignancies, based on the uh, expression of Aurora A, in, um, Aurora A kinase in those tumors. And so we're bringing forth um, this is a protocol that's now in review. The LOI was approved uh, with the cradle investigator Laura Goff there that we worked with to get this moving forward. And we may be bringing, we recently submitted an RO1 looking at MEX-CDK in combination in KRAS mutant colorectal cancer 
based on some preclinical in vivo work I had done while I was at KCI in combination with Judy Seabolt, who was initially at Pfizer and subsequently moved to University of Michigan. And so in combination with her, Dr. Huckster and Dr. Stein, we recently submitted this R01 and um, through Yale University and will probably be moving forward as well with an LOI through the CTEP mechanism based on drug availability issues with the specific drug companies um, that we were initially working with. And my very final slide, it doesn't all have to be signal transduction or DNA damage repair. This is a concept that one of our junior investigators, Joe McLaughlin, had presented to me. We're tweaking it and working on it. Um, and um, last uh, couple Saturdays ago, Joe, Kurt, and David and I sat down to start working more specifically on this. But I'm hoping by the end of December, I've already presented it to the NCI. We've tweaked it a little bit. We've got a lot more tweaking to do, but they're very interested. They have all the drugs that we need, and hopefully we will not only do personalized medicine with targeted agents, but all, well, targeted signal transduction agents, but also with immunotherapeutics in the future. I'm pretty excited about this. I mean, a one-week junior investigator who comes up with an idea like this, I think we should do nothing less than totally support it um, and be as passionate as he is in moving it forward. And with that, I thank you all very much.